the Management Event of the Year with ICC Sri Lanka and SEMA. A fireside chat with Sri Lanka's most prominent, bold and daring entrepreneurs together for the first time. Harry Javardana, Sumar Pereira, Meryl J. Fernando, Dhammika Pereira, Ashok Patrage and Janak Hydramani. So this is round one completed. But we are going to have a summation and an extracting of the vital points that were covered. And for that, I'd like to invite the partner for human capital, Deloitte Consulting, Mr. Piyush Arya. Please pay him heed. He has a short summary, and then we'll move on uh, as planned. I hate to come in between such an interesting discussion. It's difficult to summarize this. Primary reason, because the range of experience that sits on this uh, panel, it's, it's just amazing. And the stories and the reasons for the success are so different. But yet, the key points, <clears throat> we heard the primary question was what counted for the success. And we heard them talk about different reasons that explain their success. I mean, starting from Mr. Jay Vardhani, accident, 1977, changed the course of his life. Mr. Pereira summed it up very well, the ability to f learn and the ability to fight. Mr. Fernando's story was outstanding. It all started from empowerment of the tea workers. Uh, but yet, there was an underlying theme of managing the policy makers that has helped each of them grow in this environment. I would just like to leave a thought behind. A thought is about we existing in an increasingly VUCA world. Have you heard of the term VUCA? So VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. VUCA has got a relationship with entrepreneurship. The more VUCA it is, the better it is for entrepreneurs. So the thought that I would like to leave behind is, five or six years down the line, a similar fireside chat, if it were to be organized, we expect stories of new entrepreneurship emerge and succeed not in 30 years, not in 20 years, in four or five years. Someone had said it took a long time to get to one billion. Snapchat got it within a year. So next time when this fireside chat is organized, we expect some of you from the audience to actually see it over here. So with this thought, I leave it to Arun to take forward. Thank you. That certainly was a brief summary. Thank you very much, Piyush. Back in the year 1965, when we were boys, <laughs> there was a very popular song that came out of a Broadway theatrical, The Man of La Mancha. Nobody needs to worry too much about The Man of La Mancha, but I'll tell you, the song was impossible dream and that was sung by at least half a dozen people Andy Williams being one of many performers of that song and so it was what they call an international hit now as we move to round two of this fireside chat and it is quite a chat uh, as we moved round two our focus is on the management we had rise to the top or journey to the top and now the management it's interesting that in that period, the song was very, very popular. I said 1965, it was part of a movie theme as well in 1972. Don't need all these details. But Robert Kennedy, young Robert Kennedy, was an aspirant to the presidency. But you see, he was young. And uh, there had been some sort of rally that was organized. And this song was featured in that rally. And Senator McGovern was the one who had apparently suggested that this song be used. Impossible dream for the rally of an aspirant. So Robert Kennedy might have been perturbed. So he comes and asks Robert McGovern, what was the rationale for you to use that song? Is it because it was popular? So McGovern said, oh, well, what I had in mind was that if it is a dream and it is thought impossible, 
then one must follow the dream to see whether it is possible. And I hope that the people understand that. Interesting. So Robert Kennedy said, I think that's what I think too. So be that as it may, the Delandero brothers will launch forth into their version of the impossible dream and try to relate the lyric to what we will hear. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you to the Delanero brothers with the testosterone version of the impossible dream. <laughs> and now, we are with round two, and we ask Mr. Kasim to box on. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Arun. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you, list one thing that you regret not doing, and one that thing that you feel that will be, uh, will be a legacy on your part. Something that you regret that you couldn't do, and something that you feel that people will remember you forever. Uh, one of my role models uh, on the panel here is Mr. Miril Fernando. If I get another chance, yeah. I'd like to build a brand. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I think for the, you know, the audience is here not only to listen to our life story, to same, take something away in the new millennial way of doing things, I think brand, brand, and brand. You know, you must all aspire to build a brand. And we can all take inspiration from Mr. Meryl Fernando. Thank you. Thank you. I regret not going to business school. So I think the opportunity, yeah. I had the opportunity, I didn't take it. But business school is very important. And I think all the young people in the audience, I would recommend that they go to business school. Because you have a different thinking when you go to business school. And I would like to be remembered as a, a, a leader who tried to get to the top and got halfway there. OK. <laughs> Very modest. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Namika? I'm not regretting anything. Because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not living in the history, you know. I'm so happy in this chair now. I'm happy. Because of that, I'm thinking like that. Because of that, for anything for you all, don't regret. For what? Because you're living now. Why you regret and thinking in the previous data and, you know, those kind of a thing? Keeping your mind, upset your mind. Why? No point. Uh, well, most ask. of the audience here, I believe, they have gone to universities, they have gone to high studies, studied here, studied uh, overseas, and have a lot of professional qualifications. I have none. But my university, none of you will have one. <laughs> that is the university of life. <laughs> <laughs> If somebody can go to that university, you learn from the day one what is right, what is wrong. The world is your market. And in business, you must achieve and aim at first. Don't copy others. I was told that there is going to be a conference, some chain uh, world or something like that recently, that after Uber, after internet after emails, all that, the new generation. So think of the future, what is coming first. The Google, the Facebook, they have thought, what will catch on with the latest trends, what will catch on, and what can be sold, what will the world accept. Don't think of Sri Lanka. Think of the world, is your market, and don't uh, don't go back, always go forward. Failures are the failures of success, our ancestors have said that. That is true. Just because you fail once, fail twice, you go forward. Look at our politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Someday, you know, they still continue to contest and they lose. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a different area. In business, you can't do that. You always have determination. You must always have your feet on the ground and always think big to become big. If you think small, you'll become small, you'll never get. And take decisions. 
That is very important. If you don't take decisions, if you keep on postponing decisions, then you will never be a success. And delegate authority. Have faith in your, in your generals whom you employ. If they go wrong way, take action. Have discipline. The whole curse of this country is no discipline. If you have discipline, we don't hear this, uh, we don't see these uh, demonstrations, we don't see this uh, every day the newspapers, what they are reporting. So, my conviction in this matter is that whatever you do, you should have pride in your work. Even if you are carrying buckets, you must be happy that you are carrying buckets. <laughs> Unfortunately, here there is a class barrier. Look at the unemployed. Now here, all the business leaders are here. You try to advertise and get, a, get, get, get the man or the girl whom you want, they don't come. Now besides, the money is in the garment industry. I'm sure one of these days, you'll have to import your workers. Is that right? We are okay, but uh, we are struggling. In the tea industry, it's the same. There are no coconut pluggers. There are no DC uh, huskers and DC uh, people to operate the mills. Why? The class barrier. If you can uh, eliminate that and give the proper place, but in other countries there are a lot of people, there are carpenters, masons, all our skilled men have gone abroad. And we are starved. That is the biggest problem we are facing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Javadan. Uh, uh, Meryl, do you like to make a brief comment? Mr. Dhammi Kapira and Mr. Harry Javadan have said more than a mouthful. I would only say that at the time I started working, I had only 18 clerks, accountant, no CFOs, no CEOs. They worked as hard as I did, even more. They would work late into the night, come early in the morning like your own thing. Now, in that culture, to grow a business, you can establish a business, you can do branding, you can do anything, you have the whole team after you. Today, those values, attitudes are gone. People come, learn for a year or two, get a look for a better pay and go there because they don't stay. Very, very few people stay and do. And the other thing, therefore, you, it is not easy today to build large businesses. However, all the technology that is available today, I didn't even dream of then. Fortunately, I have two brilliant sons who teach me all the technology, but I tell them, your technology is very good, bring it to me, but I'll give you my practical knowledge. So we put all that together, ultimately we come with our solutions. But our trouble here is we do not motivate people to get into businesses the right way. As uh, Mr. Jawadana said, there is no training ground. Now, for example, in our tea room, I'm sure he's also, tea boys who pour tea and do and uh, infuse tea for us to taste, become exporters, and there are so many of them. When the market goes up, they disappear. All the regulations under the tea board prevent all that. Are they applied? No. If those regulations are applied, there is, pardon me, I don't want to tread on anybody's toes, the tea industry is a big fraud from the plantation right up to the phobia. I have told that to so many governments, nothing happens, and we are losing. And what is more, we also want to import tea, officially, unofficially, huge quantities are coming. How does that happen? There's not, nothing else going to happen. So, in that situation, building businesses is ex extremely difficult today because manpower is necessary. So, we turn more and more to technology, of which I'm not familiar, but judging from what my two sons contribute, they can be extremely useful. So I think what the government must do, motivate certain sectors of the people, export sector, 
fine like when Japan started, Korea, Taiwan started, they get star for performers. You earn more, so much more than anybody else, you are a star for performer, give them some perks. Then they can't question. You ask them, why do you give that? You earn so much and you will get it too. Motivate them. And punish them. Apply the rules that are excuse me, that are in the books, and all that will become right. But more important, you must place in important jobs people who know the subject and are willing to learn. Our export trade can bring in billions, billions more if it is held, geared, <coughs> managed properly. Who are the people who manage? They say import paper. Paper prices were 1,200, dropped to 600. Has anything been done it? No, did no. So it's very indifferent. It's for whatever reason, the government is extremely indifferent to import things. Give apologies to all the, my friends in politics that I say that these things must be correct. Let us think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I want the panelists, panelists to really stick to the question. We will come to your macro issues later on in the last session, I think. Ashok, uh, your question, uh, what's your own? So I have forgotten the question. What's, I know. The, what's the question? Too bad. <laughs> uh, you have to, uh, uh, question is, uh, one thing that you regret not doing, okay. and what do you like people to know you? Uh, what would be your legacy? Well, I, I don't think I have any regrets, but I think as uh, Mr. Hydromani said, I have done only up to eleven. So if I had the opportunity of doing a degree or business management, something degree. So I think today if you find, I mean, almost everybody has, I think it's a great opportunity and that's wonderful. But at our time, you know, unfortunately I didn't choose to do that. So I think that would have been one thing that I would have, you know, regretted. Um, well, I would like people to remember me as honest businessman, that's all. Nothing more than that. Thank you. Uh, I'll take a question from the audience, which is on my iPad. Yeah. And I'm sure my wife, who is in the audience, will be happy that I'm taking this question. Uh, uh, how much of your daily time do you spend in learning and also on your family? <laughs> Can I start with you, Damri? Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. You know, this is you know, that for my daytime, I all, you know, my eight hours, I put for the learning. It's not for the other things. Only the end of the you know, month, I have some few board meetings. Rather than that, I am with the team to, you know, how to develop the business. Then I, we have a free time and we are seeing the, how to restructure the ministries, right? <laughs> <laughs> because we have enough time, right, in my office. This is the reason, you know, I am so interesting, you know, because I can see, you know, whole thing, you know, how to restructure. You know, this is the way I am working. But only thing, you have to understand one thing, for five years, how many hours you have, even the political party, they have a five-year term, you know, say one day, eight hours, then one week, they, you know, into five, only 40. Year, into 50, 2,000 hours per year. Then five years, they have only 10,000 hours to work. You know, for the politician, I think maybe they have to, you know, go to the village and those kind of a thing, other activities, everything, I think maybe they can put maybe few hours for the other activities, you know, for to develop the country. This is the main th reason what I can think, you know. <laughs> because, you know, every year 2,000 into five, only 10,000 hours for the next five years, you know. It's time is most important part. Yeah. Then for me, because of that, put the right, that eight hours, because of that I can see everything, you know. Then the family after that, this is the reason you cannot see me in any cocktail or any evening weddings, when I'm not going, I'm going home. <laughs> because of that, you know, I'm keeping my family time also. Okay. Then, okay. Um, so, yeah. know that. Mr. Jawal, you know, and... Well, just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Out of 24 hours, 
I am at work 16 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I do that, I would have been so long time ago. We have to, not only in Sri Lanka, we have a lot of investments in other, other areas. We do a lot of business with other countries, which is not known in Sri Lanka. There are so many things. All of you all can go to any place and look. There are many things that one could pick up. I see, but unfortunately they are too small for us and we don't, we turn an Elsonian knife for those things. Look at these countries that have come in the Middle East. They are very young. Only after they stuck oil, they are in this position. Who weave the harvest? It's the Britishers and the Europeans and, you know, except India, where they had a trade agreement with Russia. All countries, they had a Comic-Con. I don't know how, how many of you all know. Russia, Hungary, Poland, India, they trade between themselves. And who earned? People who had money. Switzerland, Japan, Holland, England. They had bought a business. They were the middlemen. Now today we are talking of coconuts. They are sold at 30 rupees to any producer. The producer is losing. The consumer is free, these trade. 70 rupees or 65 rupees, something like that. They exchange goods. Now today, that era is gone. Now it has become free economy. But now it's coming back again. So as I said, the world is your business. World is your market. So all of you all should not say here, this is a small country. All the rooms are, all the rooms are occupied. So getting to the new business area is very limited. Thanks. You cannot. Don't waste time, go outside. There are emerging countries where you can pick up so many things. There are some entrepreneurs who have started newly with so many ideas, but there is no encouragement now. Now you have this en entrepreneurs exhibition or something like that. I am glad that at least at this stage, the government has taught of giving money to the village people, village boys and girls. You start something, but our market is limited. In India, if the entrepreneur started one towel manufacturer, he sells one point, some billions of towels. That is how they became experts in textiles. Do you agree with me, Mr. Hyderabadi? India, they started their business with Comic-Con countries, and they learned the experience. We don't make that such kind of numbers. Janak, you like me? <laughs> this is why the governments at that time, Mrs. Gandhi, Mr. Nehru, all these people, they knew that they have no expertise. They have to dump these goods. If you went to Russia at that time, a towel you could not use in your face. Today, the best of towels you find in self in uh, Marks and Spencer's. Why? They have learned the best of saris. The entire textile trade, they learned from this bilateral trade, from these Comic-Con countries. Except few like Mr. Janak, we, the people didn't come here. Mr. Jayavan, I'll pick, pick yes. on that in the final session. I'll yes. park that question. There's a question here to, to Ashok. Somebody's saying that you overpaid for Odell. And what are the principles you follow when you, when you make an investment? I thought that's a very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know that I should explain that here. <laughs> Maybe I should I have warned you before. <laughs> Maybe I should have warned you. <laughs> so, uh, I, I really don't know whether I should uh, explain this. Uh, Maybe you can talk about the principles. Right, I think that yeah. uh, you know, it was a really good deal for us. Uh, because uh, you know, if you look at the, the assets what we got, I think that's more than the amount that what we paid. So I think the company, we got it free. Okay, is that enough, the answer? Maybe too short, no? Huh? Maybe too short. <laughs> Maybe in terms of principles, what are the principles oh, you generally? Yeah, of course, yeah. that we were already in the, the fashion business. We were the largest uh, branded, international branded uh, retail uh, re retailer. So obviously, it was a fantastic buy for us. And we, you know, I have always told that whatever the industry that we want to go, right, we wanted to see the possibility that how we can come to the number one position. We don't like number two and number three. If we think that we don't have a uh, we don't have a shot at the number one, we might as well leave the industry. So that is how that we evaluate businesses. So, so that's the very reason that when we got the opportunity, we thought it was a fantastic opportunity. So we took that and today we have established ourselves as the 
ఈ రోజు లార్జెస్ట్ ఫ్యాషన్ రేట్ ఈ బాట్ కాటన్ కలెక్షన్ ఆల్సో ఫ్యూ డేస్ సో దట్ వాస్ ఆల్సో పార్ట్ ఆఫ్ ది స్ట్రాటజీ ఓకే రైట్ సో ఐ థింక్ దోస్ ఆర్ వెరీ వెల్ డెవలప్ యు నో యు నో వెరీ యు నో ప్యాషనేట్ పీపుల్ హు హవ్ బిల్డ్ దిస్ బిజినెసెస్ ఓవర్ సో మెనీ ఇయర్స్ టైమ్ సో ఐ మస్ట్ సే యు నో ఐ యామ్ వెరీ ఆనర్ టు హావ్ టేకన్ ఓవర్ దిస్ కంపెనీస్ అండ్ ఆల్సో ఈజ్ నాట్ లైక్ యు నో ఐ హావ్ ఫోర్స్ దెమ్ టు సెల్ ఐ మీన్ ఇట్ ఈస్ యు నో బేసికలీ దే హ్యావ్ spoken to us because they must be most probably believe in that may be the right guy that who can take care of the brand and take it to the next level okay so i think i'm very happy about all this acquisition